So we're picking it up, Acts chapter 18, verse 18 is where we're picking it up from. We're going to finish off the chapter tonight, I'm pretty sure we are. Uh, and I really mean that tonight. I think I mean that, so amen. And here we go, uh, Acts chapter 18, verse 18, the Bible says, So Paul still remained a good while, then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria. And Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Centria, for he had taken a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they asked him to stay a, uh, stay a longer time with them, he did not consent but took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem, but I will return again to you, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over the region of Galatia and Phrygia, in order strengthening all the disciples. Okay. We're going to stop right there. And we'll pick up the second half of this. So, it's been some time, a number of weeks. We've had conferences. We had, uh, uh, I believe Brother Bobby stepped in and, and gave us some of uh, Acts chapter 18. But how many know our memories don't always serve us perfectly and we may not have all those details fresh in our mind. The, the details we need to remember tonight are this. That Paul, on his journey with his team, it was very clear by everything he did, everything he said, everything he was willing to go through. And I'm talking about suffering. He went through pain. He went through suffering. He went through some abuse. And some of his, his fellow partners, uh, co-laborers in Christ went through struggles. But the willingness to do all of that the reason was clear, and the motive was clear. The reason was God commanded him to go into all the world and preach the gospel. God commanded him to preach to the Jew and to the Gentile. God commanded him and instructed him that one day he would end up uh, touching many Gentiles, which that's you and I, folks. Come on. And so his reason was souls. That was the reason. God commanded him, he obeyed the Lord, and everywhere he went, it was to preach the good news. I'm going to stop right here and ask this question. Is Jesus still good news to you? Amen. Amen. Or is it just one of those things, part of your life, the way you sort of talk, you know, the t-shirt you wear, the Bible you hold, it's really not necessarily good news. The gospel means good news. One of the, the finest definitions is the good news of God. The good news is that we don't have to end up in eternal separation and suffering, separated from God because of our sin. No one has to end up in hell. Every single person can become a believer. Not everybody will, but everybody can. The book of Romans tells us, how can they believe if they have not heard? And how will they hear without a preacher? And how will they who preach get there if they're not sent? The message of the gospel, the good news, the reason Paul went through what he went through, pressed in, fought through, hung in there, was souls were at stake. And it was so important to him. His, that was his reason. His motive was love. God saved Paul, brought him out of the deepest kind of darkness. You know, there's a lot of sin people can be involved in. And, and, and people may feel some sins are worse than others, and it's really ugly. When, you know, but I'm going to tell you right now, according to what I see in Scripture, I think the worst kind of bondage is self-righteousness. I don't think there's a bondage worse than that. 
no drug addiction, no alcoholism, no perversion is more powerful than self-righteousness. Why? Because self-righteousness is this belief that I am okay, I don't need God. I don't need an outside righteousness imparted into my life. And there are many people who you might encounter if the good news is still the good news and you still feel the need to tell somebody that Jesus loves them and that he wants to forgive them and give them a brand new life. You know, folks, you'll run into encounters where people, you'll, you'll find these people where they're like, well, that's, no, no, thank you. No, thank you. I don't need that. It's hard to convince somebody who believes they're all right that they're not. Self-righteousness. And so Paul was brought out of this deep bondage. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. This guy believed he was doing God a favor when he would persecute the church. When he'd go after believers, he thought he was doing God a favor. It took God knocking him down to the floor. Some people think he was riding a horse. The Bible doesn't actually say he was riding a horse. It says God knocked him to the floor. Whether he was on the horse or not, I just think if he was on the horse, when he hit the floor, I think he'd have some injuries. <laughs> you think about that. Either way, God knocked him to the floor and awoke in this man and, re and, and he came up a new man. And he realized he wasn't doing God a favor. He was fighting against the very king of kings. And so God burst his heart with love. And now his purpose was souls. His reason was love. For God so loved the world, he gave his only son. And whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. Right? God so loved us that he reached in and pulled us out of the darkness, the miry clay. Have we forgotten this? Have we become convinced that somehow, some way, we sort of got our life together and now we're doing pretty good and that's why we're here? Or do we remember that there was bondage and chains all around us and Jesus rescued us because he loves us? Paul, verse 18 says, so Paul still remained a good while and what he was doing was strengthening church. He was showing them how to love God, even in hardship. He goes on to say, then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He had his hair cut off at Centria, for he had taken about. So, I want to point out that there's not much to know about him getting his hair cut. So, are you guys all good with that really having to know any major details there. Let me know that the only thing that stands out really there is that Paul was a man of his word. He made a vow somewhere. Studying Bibles and commentaries may give you some indication of what that was all about. You know what? It's not really that important. What's important is that this man made a vow and he kept it. Man. And apparently it was important to him and the person who he made it to, whether it be a group or people, he made a vow and this and Paul wouldn't cut his hair off. I'm not going to spend much time on that except to just remind us of this. The Bible tells us to let our yes be yes and our no be no. Yeah, that's right. Don't be a person making promises. I've done it. I've broken people's hearts. I've broken promises. I've come to find out human beings aren't good at this. Amen. So it's better not to say, I will. Plans. It's better to say, I will try with all my heart. I will give my best. That's not an excuse. Mean it. But let's be careful not to make promises. Because the Bible does tell us that God cares about our, vow, our promise. And God's word tells us it's better not to vow than to make a promise and break it. Right. Now, We'll say one more thing about that, we're going to move on. And that's this. There are some people who take a weird uh, spin on that. So let me clarify for you. It's not going to be okay 
on that last day when we're standing before God in judgment, and we say, say to God, hey God, I always knew I wasn't going to be able to serve you. I always knew I wasn't going to be able to stop drinking, stop partying, stop doing them drugs, stop cussing and fighting. I always knew I wasn't, God. So I followed what your word said and I just didn't bow because you said it's better not to do it. That ain't going to fly on judgment. Day. Right. And some people think like that. You realize that? Some people actually think, I just won't make any promises because God's word said it's better not to. That's not what he's talking about. That's not what he's talking about. It's, it has a lot to do with influence. God wants us to reach people. God wants us to show the love of God, the power of God, the life-changing word of God active in our life. God wants people to see that we're, we're people being changed by this awesome God we serve, right? But if we're inconsistent, you know, we're up and down, breaking promises and all that. You know, at first people can't see, they really can't see Jesus. You and I can't see him with our physical eye. But what people see is the Jesus in us. They knew us before. They realized that we couldn't have done it on our own. God changed us. God worked in our lives. And he's working in our lives. They see Jesus. They identify that Jesus is in you. But I'll tell you right now, if you and I are all over the place, we're moody, up and down, one thing one day, one thing the next, they're not going to see Jesus in you. What they're going to see is that person, this person, Man, woman, no matter what age, this person hasn't changed yet. So their words don't match their actions. Get that? Is that that? Okay. All right. So he took a bow, guys. The thing I want to point out to you, verse 18, and we move on, is something we talked about before, but we'll talk about it again. Because it's all sort of encased in the same thought of Paul the Apostle and his team people on his team kept being added. And God added people to this team of ministers. For what purpose? To win, to build, and to send. It, it, it's pretty clear. And so we see in verse 18, there's Priscilla and Aquila added to the team. Verse 18 says, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. And he had said, I don't think they could have um, what was one of the details we talked about last time? Why is it important? I'll tell you. It's a rare thing in the Bible. Whenever a woman's name is called out before her husband's name, God is not a chauvinist. That's a weird thing that's being propagated in our world today. You know, this is a weird thing that we're hearing. God loves men and women equally. He shed the same amount of blood equally. We are equal in the eyes of God. We're just different. And that's good. That's a good thing, right? Amen. Aren't you glad that there's a difference? Amen. Some of you are scared to say it. <laughs> See, that's the, the day we live in. Don't be afraid to say it. It's a good thing to be what God meant for, me, for us to be. It's a good thing to be different. Amen. So, the way God views it according to his scripture is equal in value, different in role. Right. Yeah. Different in what you bring to the table. Okay? I'm sorry, man. No matter how you look at it, you're never going to be able to give birth to what you can be. <laughs> well, nowadays with doctors, and that, that means that doctors are goofing you up, and God didn't create that. I'm not even going to tell you, ladies, what, no matter what you can do, because I'll get in trouble. I don't even know. I don't even know what happened. Ladies are already looking at me with their eyebrows. Go ahead, Pastor. You're fine. It's all right. I pass. I'll be. That's cool. No, ladies, equal in value, different in purpose and role, different. But the Bible, whenever the Bible does this, there's a powerful reason. Priscilla and Aquila. It doesn't say Aquila and Priscilla. And as you read it in context, finishing the rest of chapter 18, you understand why. First, it identifies them as part of Paul's team. And that is in ministry context. They're doing the work of God. The other thing is this, that as you read on, you see that God chose this couple to teach, to disciple. And so... Why is Priscilla called out first? 
because it's believed that she was the lead teacher in that family. Does it mean she was higher or lesser than her husband? Does it mean the husband was a wimp and uh, I don't want to say anything, you just say it. I mean any of that. Simply means her gifting was to teach. Priscilla was, uh, Aquila was also good at teaching and other things, tent making and so forth, whatever it was that they were doing. But it's clarifying, it's identifying that they were called to teach and it could very well be that the lead teacher in that group would have been Priscilla. Why do I even spend any time on that? Because there's so many people who have so many weird thoughts about what should be in, in the church and such. You know, if God's gifted you to teach, it doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. If he's gifted you to teach, you need to find yourself in a position to teach Amen. in some capacity. You need to use your gift. Amen? Amen. All right. So let's go, go ahead and move on. Verse 19. And he came to Ephesus. So Paul came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So everywhere Paul went, and it was all about preaching the good news, trying to win someone. <clears throat> Verse 20, when, he, when they asked him to stay longer, the longer time with them, he didn't consent. He wanted to go to Jerusalem to be a part of that feast. We, we know that. Verse 21 tells us that. And so he sailed for Ephesus. Verse 22. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and greeted, uh, and greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. So when he landed at Caesarea and gone up and gone up, let me read that again. Gone up and greeted the church. So what, what we're pointing out here is Paul got there and he went and greeted the church, the people of God. Folks, I want I can't emphasize it more. You know, this may not be this heavy, uh, heavy experience tonight in church, but we need to get this. Paul, Paul's heart is just so much for the souls, it, the winning of souls, the making sure when he would stop at churches, he wanted to make sure the people of God were being taught right. He wanted to make sure that they were learning how to live for God. And so when he would greet the church, it was an intention. It wasn't an accident. He wasn't passing by, oh, hey, there's that church. I'll pass by, say hi real quick. That was one of the stops. That was the first stop many times. Let's make sure the church is okay. Let's make sure the church is healthy. It's being handled and developed and being, uh, being uh, developed into a healthy place where people are growing, serving, living for God, launching, reaching people. Folks, if you would say that that's supposed to be the same to this day. Our churches need to be healthy and able to do what God wants us to do. Is that, is that true or not? Yes, amen, it's true. It's never changed. That's God's purpose for the church, for us to do His work. And... And it's motivated by love. And I love it about Paul because he'll come in and he'll check and he'll make sure because he knows the enemy also shows up to church. The enemy will sit next to you and whisper in your ear. The enemy will mess with you. And, and, you know, you ever notice how you, you, you probably feel pretty good all the way up into before Wednesday, before Sunday. You ever notice how the enemy's really good at just trying to throw something in there where, you know, maybe I don't need to go to church today. Has anybody ever noticed this? Amen. He's really good at it. You could be, it could be Monday, man. All right, this is going to be good. Looking forward to it. Tuesday, yeah, I hope we're filling up to it. By Wednesday, you know, there's a fight. And miraculously, Wednesday night, around 8.30, 8.45, if you happen to stay home, you got healed. You feel good again. Did you hear this? I'm telling you from experience. I've been here. I, this has happened to me. Where you're uh, there's a chew. <laughs> you know, I don't feel so good. Yeah. You know, at 8, 7, 30, 8, well, they're probably worshiping right now. You know, by 8, 30, 8, 45, they're wrapping it up. And you know, for some reason, I feel good again. Hey, I feel all right. And you missed it. You think that was the Lord? All right, let's keep going. The Lord, the flesh, and the enemy and, and working together, looking to rob you, looking to rob those who you would touch, you would bless. Amen. All right, so the Bible says, and after he greeted the church, he went down to Antioch. Verse 23. After he had spent some time there, he departed 
and went over the region of Galatia and uh, Phrygia, Phrygia, excuse me, in order to strengthen all the disciples. This man's love for God's people was amazing. He would risk his life. He'd go into places that were re weren't recommended because there was danger involved. But he would risk his life to, in this case, do what? Strengthen the disciples. What does that mean? Come on. That means these are already disciples. If you're a disciple, uh, and I really just believe that Jesus didn't come to make comments. I think he didn't come to make disciples. That's what the Bible says. Going to all the world to make disciples. So when you become a believer, you should become a disciple. That's the day you become a disciple, where you follow Christ. And that is an ongoing thing. And that's not an easy thing. And that's a fight. It's a good fight of faith. It's a blessing. It's powerful. It's beautiful. It's effective. Uh, and there's so much about it. But you know what? You're learning as you go. You're learning as you go. And so if you are a disciple, then you're plugged in to a source of learning. That's called the church. Well, you know, I'm a pretty busy guy, so I don't really get a chance to be at church that much. But hey, my church is the radio. My church is the TV or the internet. Folks, that happens, that happens to be okay once in a while, but I promise you it does not replace the, the gathering together in the flesh to pray for one another, to worship alongside of each other, to care about one another, to see each other, to realize that our others are in the fight with you, to realize that your part in it is to make sure others are okay as others are looking at you saying, are you okay? It's a body. It's something that when we're strong together in unity, we're able to do the work of God effectively. But you know when we're scattered and split and all over the place, folks, you might be hearing some good messages, getting a few good things out there. And it may be helping you, but folks, it doesn't replace that gathering together. That's why Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some, or as some do, but even all the more coming together as you see the day approaching. Don't forsake it. Recognize the value. Of coming together. Paul was strengthening the disciples. Why? Because they had a purpose. Here's the hard thing about coming to church. It's the hard thing. Is you're not going to go through the church, go through a service. You might get through a couple, get through a couple services, but every service you're going to hear something about that purpose. And get challenged by it. And there comes a point in everyone's, everyone's life where you have to answer it. You have to answer it to God. Not to me. Not to anybody who's trying to encourage you. To God. Your call. Your purpose. Between you and God. That's got to be answered. Why? Because God loves the world. God loves the lost. And you may say, well, I'm in no condition to do anything to help. Sure you are. How many of you know how to talk? <laughs> Every hand to the window. I'm in no condition to help. If you can talk, I mean, some of us, even if you're not that good at talking, you can text like a crazy person. <laughs> you can communicate. Come on, now. We can help. We can do something. I'm in no condition. Can anybody eat? I like eating. Anybody like eating? Isn't that great? Oh, eating, man, I can eat. I'll eat with you. You know, sometimes you can put a meal together and turn it into a fellowship, a courage, a Bible study, or even a witness. I mean, asking them, you were to my house? Yeah. What if they want to drink? Do you tell them? No problem, Coke or Pepsi or, you know, Sprite. <laughs> Everything else, sorry. Don't, right. don't break your testimony before. Yep. They really want to know how to be free. Not how to compromise. Anyway, let's keep going. Paul strengthened the churches. Strengthen. Amen. Verse 24, now. It actually starts off with the word now. 
I didn't just say that. <laughs> now, a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man, and a mighty, and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the ways of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Aquila and Priscilla heard him. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. Here's that couple. Here's that couple. And so as a part of the teaching team, here's Priscilla and Aquila. And as a part of teaching uh, uh, Apollos, Aquila and Priscilla, they were a team. And they taught as a team. And they took this man. You need to know who this man is. Uh, Apollos uh, turns out to be a powerful man of God that Paul refers to a lot. We don't have the time tonight to show you all the different places that he's referred to. But I remember a place where Paul said, hey, let's not have division in the church. Some of you say, I'm under Paul. Others say, I'm under Apollos. Apollos must have made some serious impact to be measured up next to Paul. Okay? So this man of God was powerful, and he was an eloquent speaker, a good speaker, a good minister, and fervent in spirit. In other words, what's that fervency? What is fervency? It's when you're passionate, focused, and unrelenting, and you're going after it, and nothing's going to do, uh, move you aside or divert you. You're not going to get derailed. You're fervent. Okay? Apollos was fervent. Only problem is, he'd, know, he'd only know one baptism. The baptism of John. Well, what's the other baptism? Some people believe there is only one baptism. Well, then this, would, this part of the Bible wouldn't even be in there if there was only one baptism. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is what we're referring to. There was the baptism in water, and there's the baptism of, of the Spirit. What's the important thing here? The important thing is a couple that's part of Paul's team, Priscilla and Aquila, they knew that you can't do the work of God effectively without the power of the Spirit. Amen. You're not going to touch lives the way they need to be touched. You're not going to reach the lost without the power of God. It's not going to happen. You can be eloquent. You can teach. You can bring stuff out that's interesting, and it may help somebody's knowledge, but it will never bring the change, fusion that happens when the Spirit of God brings the Word of God and pierces your heart, convicts you, and draws you to a place of decision where you just start serving God because you know you need to serve the Lord. That happens under the power of the Spirit. And this fervent man, this wise, eloquent man, faithful man, he was, well, he was doing this work, but unaware that he needed the Spirit of God. And so Priscilla and Aquila pulled him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. This church, speaking specifically in Montebello, I'm throwing East LA in there because we got unfinished business in East LA. Hacienda Heights and Highland Park. God wants it reached. There are people in your family, in your circle of friends, co workers, neighbors. God wants them reached. But I can tell you right now little, nice little clever tricks and good little ideas and smart little, oh, they're never going to do it. It's going to be the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the more accurate way. And so, I'd say this, when we pray God break our hearts with what breaks your, with what breaks God's heart, I believe the way God answers that prayer is the Holy Spirit steps in and cuts peels back the callus easily grows. What's callus? Callus is that stuff that grows on your feet. <laughs> well, it grows in your hands and other places too. But if you ever notice, it grows on your feet and it makes your feet less sensitive. Right? You see some people getting their feet done, sanding their feet. I don't know what they do. It looks nicer and all that. But the reality is, after they're done, their feet are sensitive. Got rid of that dead layer that doesn't allow that 
touch. Right? The Holy Spirit will come in and rip that callus right off your heart. Amen. You'll look at a lost soul and you'll weep again. You'll start thinking about your family, even the ones you don't like. Um. And he just said, I did, because I know how families can be. Some family members don't like you, and you might not like them. And you just kind of keep a secret, though. Because you're a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> you'll look at them and all of a sudden your heart will start breaking for them some people even get mad at God God I don't want to cry out for them they're such jerks I don't want to weep over them but you'll be what happened because as much as they might be a jerk or how they might call us a jerk I don't know it still means they hate Jesus they need us the Savior. They need forgiveness. Time is short. They need some time to live for God. To watch the hope of glory. There is a more accurate way. It's by the power of the Spirit. Folks, I ask you, I encourage you, ask God to break your heart. Ask the Holy Spirit to empower you to do God's work. We're going to bring this to a close. Somebody shout out the time for me, please. 8.30. Verse 27, and when he desired to cross to Achaia, he desired, I believe that's Apollos, Apollos desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Apollos, in his fervency, in his faithfulness, now in a more accurate way, under the power of the Holy Spirit, just became more effective. Powerfully effective. And lives were changed. And we just finished chapter 18, like I said, we were 